All right, here it goes. In five, four, three, two, one. Incoming. <laughs> Greetings, Omnic Lab residents. We're the Omnic Lab ourselves. We are a podcast that focuses on the game Overwatch and the strategies that you can come up with while playing. I'm your host, Rob May, and through our show, we learn through a trial and error type basis where Andres and I are learning as well as operating the scientific <coughs> method in the game of Overwatch, trying to make sure we figure out what works and watching the pros and seeing what works for them. Sometimes it gets a little crazy, it blows up in here, but don't worry. We will brew you some team composition strategies, some little tips to help you play better, and even some helpful equipment that you guys can take into the field and gain that strategic strategic edge. I almost made it all the way through after like two weeks off. <laughs> uh, joining me, as always, is Andres Gomez from Georgia. What's up, Andres? What's up, Rob? Man, it's good to be back. It's, I feel like we're both oh, a little yeah. rusty being like two weeks off since you had to move um, mm. and stuff. But I'm glad to see you, man. Glad to see you made it safely to the other end of the world and um, that you can still podcast with me. May, you might also yeah. be wondering why my voice is sounding so silky smooth today. Silky. As mm. opposed to uh, our other recordings. Um, it just so happened that we had an amazing uh, listener of the show uh, or beloved Brian K has uh, done a super super amazing donation to the show. He sent me this amazing guy, the Rode Procaster, over in the mail. I just got it last week. Finished installing That's a great it, mic. and this is now what I'm using for the show. So good news, you won't have to listen to me anymore through uh, headset microphones. Now uh, you get to see hear me like this. Yeah, dynamic mics. So, Andres, what are we talking about today? Hey, for some I'm reason, you have like here. a very robotic key, like popping through your voice. All right, let me adjust that really quick here. Yeah, let's do it before we keep moving on. We don't want our listeners to be hearing pops and clicks, especially the day we get a new mic to make uh, our listening experience even better. Mm-hmm. Don't worry, folks. All of this will be taking out in post. That is the magic of editing. This hands will remove it. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear it loud and clear. All right. Um, we actually need to restart from the top. Sorry. Okay. Because I lost my recording there, if that's okay. Okay, no we'll just I'll clip that on the post. It's better to have it now than later. All right, I'm going to just delete whatever we have. Okay. And, and then uh, uh, I'll start recording here. And then uh, let's do a clap real quick to sync it. One, two, three. Wait, 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 wait. I'm not recording. Let's restart again. Okay. Let's do it. One, two, three, four. Man, beauties of live recording, folks. All right. Let me run the music. Here we go. Three, two, one. In five, four, three, two, one. Incoming. Greetings, scientists and pedestrians alike. Welcome to the Omnic Lab, where a podcast that focuses on the strategies inside the game of Overwatch. We're going to help you learn through trial and error in the lab, just alongside us scientists, even if things get a bit crazy and blow up. We're going to help you guys give you this competitive edge that you're going to need 
through instruments, team comps, and even some tips just to get you that little bit more of a mental edge even when you jump into Overwatch. My name is Rob May. I'm your host alongside with my right-hand man and equal host, <laughs> Andres Gomez. What's up, Andres? What's up, Rob? It's good to be back, man. I feel like we've been long. We've been gone for far too long, and it's it's overdue. It's overdue when we do a podcast. Uh, we see that you made it all the way to the other side of the world. Glad to have you back, man. It's good to be here. I got a little sunburned at the beach, and a uh, short little update. Um, the reason we didn't do it last week, even though we actually could have, um, I woke up that morning and felt really crummy and told Andres about it, and then I proceeded to go to the hospital every day for three days after that. <laughs> I had four kidney stones, so it was a little little rough. So. That sounds like a rough arrival, especially when you're moving to a new country. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you know, they were you know all they say? being dehydrated on the plane and stuff. So it's all good now. Yeah, that's really how it happens, like with water and stuff. But you know what they say: no pain, yeah. no gain. That's right. That's right. <laughs> hey, on brighter I'm news, though. Testing. On brighter news, you might be wondering uh, why my voice is sounding so silky smooth today. Tell me. Tell me. It just mm. so happens that uh, I got a new mic, courtesy of. Our beloved listener Brian K. He uh, has donated a mic to the show very gracefully, and um, I will be podcasting on this baby from now on. Very sweet. It sounds great on my end. So I'm sure that you folks listening at home, even after Andres runs this through post processing, is going to sound radio like as possible. So it'll be really cool. Hopefully, no more quality, Andres. Yes. Yeah. So, Andres, what are we talking about today? I know I've been a little crazy, so Andres has kind of taken the reins on figuring out what we're going with today. And then I've, I just I want to shout out at the top of the show for our admin again, Rice Crispy, and just helping me out with the news section as I'm transitioning. It's really hard to keep track of news when you're switching countries and transitioning your sleep schedule and all that. So I really, really appreciate all the help and getting me the news sure. for today's show. That guy's awesome. He's always active on the Discord channel, always keeping us updated. He's always willing to help without even asking him. He, he's a true yep. trooper. Uh, but he's yeah, a trooper. moving on with the show. Um, today we're going to be talking about a little bit about attack and defense mentality. I've been playing a ton of competitive uh, for the past two weeks. And I, I have noticed a couple of trends on uh, both ends, both on attack and defense, of just the way people are approaching both of these situations. And I don't think that the that a lot of people have like the strategic mind set in the right place for the what they should be doing or how should they should be approaching this task. So I just we just wanted to talk a little bit on on that topic and maybe highlight some stuff that you should be keeping in mind where you are in attack and as well as when you're in defense. Uh, we also got a really cool email from uh, our listener, um, Ryan Race. He wants to talk a little about Reinhardt and tanks and their situation at the moment. And we think it's very uh, timely to be talking about it. So we'll be discussing that a little yeah, later. Sure. And we'll also let you know what we've been up to, a little bit of the patch notes, some of the summer games. Um, how about we actually we start with that? What have we been testing and what have we been uh, sure. improving? And at? How about you start, Rob? So I'll start because apparently somebody in our iTunes reviews thinks that I don't play this game very often. So I actually was able to finally sit down over my transitionary period and play. And let me tell you, it was really hard playing in a four player queue in uh, the high 40s. Um, I was trying to break 50 like two nights ago and I just couldn't do it. I kept losing way too often. And honestly, I feel like we just weren't making the proper adjustments. And we queued into a team three times out of our six games into the same person playing Tracer that was just destroying our whole team, like 50 kills or more a match. Like, she was just bonkers. Jeez. So, um, and it was all on the control maps. So, like, you're just, you feel so bad losing, like, get the game after game after game. But we were able to kind of solve the issue by running double splash damage with a Pharah and a Junkrat. So one of the other guys was playing Junkrat, and I just took to the air, and I was able to kind of deal with her a little bit more. But we just couldn't press through on the uh, payload maps. We we flipped the coin and went, you know, the wrong side, so we lost. <laughs> um, but yeah, what I've been testing, though, has been a little bit of D.Va. I haven't really gotten a chance to play her much more than like a couple minutes on a match. 
but I really want to practice her some more and see what she really feels like because going along with Ryan's email today, uh, he's asking a lot of questions about Diva, and I feel like Diva is the contender right now for Reinhardt. And then um, I've been playing a lot of Zen and Ana because I've I've seen that Zenyatta's like win rate has just been shooting up, and Ana for my play style has been really good. Like I've been able to actually one v one some people, and then like when I get in trouble, just to throw out that sleep dart and then running around with your little flask is pretty deadly. Um, and uh, since I've been playing with Crispy, because he like works a night shift in the States, so I'm actually able to work alongside of him. And the queue's not bad. I have a five gigahertz, like uh, what they call SoftBank Air, which is my phone service here in, in Japan. Mm-hmm. And dang, my, my servers are not bad at all. Like, there's very little lag here, which is great. Nice. I'm just curious. You know how much ping you get playing on North American servers or that? I think when I moved countries, it reset the little thing in the top right left corner because I wasn't really monitoring it last time. I just really wanted to play. So I'll have to pay attention a little bit more and, and give you an update on what the ping's like here. But yeah, I think it's still enough. under 80. I think it's under 80. So yeah, it's not pretty good. Bad. Nice. And then uh, I was playing some Lucio after our Lucio show and really feeling good with that new wall ride. It's really freaking strong. Oh, yeah. Like, it feels a lot more the wall intuitive. And around. Yeah. And then, like I said, I was practicing some Farrah, too. So I've been trying to get better at Farrah. But, man, it's really hard to play Farrah when the opponents have, like, uh, a Zenyatta and a Soldier or a Zenyatta and, like, uh, a Widow. Like, you just get... You get picked off so fast now. I don't think you're the only one who feels say, that pain right uh, now. Yeah, I yeah. think a lot of players are struggling a little bit um, since Zenyatta has become so prevalent and McCree so common. Yeah. Same with like sometimes Soldier and stuff. Uh, but that's sure. cool, so man. You've you been trying a lot of heroes. As far as I go, I've been doing a ton of competitive play, like I said at the top of the show. I just really wanted mm-hmm. to like grind out the last two weeks of the season. I know that there's one more left in a I'll probably try to do a little more, although I don't have much left since I'll be busy on the weekend. But I wanted to get as many points as I, as I could in. I managed to climb to rank 63 at my highest. And then I was like, I was really trying to push for that 65 to get the, because uh, at that point you get the maximum amount of uh, rank points at the end of the season. You get 300. Yeah, yeah. As, f- as Right now, I think I'm getting 200 when the season ends, so I- I'll take it, mm. especially since I was able to ground, grind uh, 100 points already just by playing. So I'll be able to get my golden nice. gun once uh, the season ends, which is what I really wanted to at least. Okay, I'll get the yeah, golden gun. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, just playing a ton of that, and I've been mean, playing solo queue, duo queue, triple queue, I mean, full group, everything in between. Dude, I've been trying everything to see what works, what doesn't work. Um, unfortunately, there is there hasn't been one that has been like okay, yeah, quadruple Q is works. the way to go. Because yeah. honestly, um, I solo queued once and lost terribly my first match. Second match, we all get queued up together with a bunch of random people, but it so happened that everyone was in a good mood in that team, I guess, and they were very talkative and collaborating, and we we're like, oh, nice, yeah, this is good. We ended, up all, yeah, we ended up winning really nicely, and then at the end of the match, we all joined together, and we had a super good like run. We won like five games straight, so we all out of each other. Dang, and, um, that's sweet. Yeah, and after that, we've been all been playing together, kind of like as a group, on and off. So great experience there in solo queue, but then um, it has been the same, like grouping with the other like kinds. Like, the full group was how I was able to reach uh, rank 63. We had a full group mm-hmm. of people that kind of knew each other, want to be playing a little bit, but it wasn't anything planned or anything. We just were going to play for the, for the day, right, and we ended right. up winning a ton of matches. Um, but I don't know. It, all in all, I think that the thing that I got out of it the most was an attitude check and, more important, like the importance of team spirit. Just like realizing yeah. that bring a little bit of a positive attitude to your games and rather than like it can be so simple as the way you word your comments like uh some players will say things for example like what is happening guys i have the gold kills as reinhardt well like what are you guys doing and like like those passive aggressive comments exactly and like that that is not necessarily like 
you know, he's not insulting every anyone or not being like right. necessarily degrading anyone or just being, but it's just being like overall negative and kind of like yeah. making your team feel like they're worse maybe than they actually are, or maybe mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. making themselves conscious about not being able to perform at their best as they're doing. Um, instead right. of like comments like, um, or m more like proactive comments like, guys, we're getting destroyed by the Genji. We need to swap to a Winston, for example, so we can control it. Mm -hmm. That is a, a suggestion that your team might be able to take or disregard it, but it's a little bit more productive than, why do I have goal kills? That's right, hard. <laughs> yeah, you're like actually trying to actively solve an issue by offering your input as opposed to saying, I'm doing everything and you're not, you know, that kind of a mentality or we're getting destroyed and it's not my fault type of a, a mental check. Sometimes that mental check is really tough to say, you know what, I'm actually the problem with our team. And that's been happening here and there. Like, it kind of just depends because, like, a lot of times I'll be playing Lucio or, like, Farah, for example. And I'm just like, guys, I can't play this hero. And it's really hard for me to hit this Tracer. Does somebody want to play Lucio instead? And, like, I was surprised at how willing some people were to adjust once you, like, are, like, giving them information that you're really bad at that hero. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like absolutely. that should happen maybe sooner rather than later. A lot like, of times. Communication is so, so key in this game. And the more I play it, yeah. the more you realize about this. And not just like, um, you know, saying what your general team strategy is going to be in the beginning, not just deciding what your team is yep. going to be, but also letting your teammates know what is happening to you during the game, right? If you're constantly getting picked up by the tracer and nobody seems to notice, um, just letting your team know, like, hey guys, I'm basically getting taken out of the game with this tracer. I cannot do anything. Can I get somebody to come here back here with me? And like, sometimes your team might not be realizing that that is why things are not working, right? Like one of the healers is getting picked up like um, a little bit before they can engage or something like that. And once they realize that, they can watch out for that and help you out and then that way i don't know you you progress the team like that but just like letting your team know like little details like that can be so important but um anyway sure that is we don't what want to steal I, too much of our main topic thunder here so yeah let's, yeah uh, let's jump right into the too. news and passion notes real fast uh th this won't be too long so let's uh, jump right in all right so the first thing that we have on the docket is 7500 accounts were hit with a ban hammer that is a lot of <laughs> cheating ban hammers. And let me tell you this, guys. In the court of law, Blizzard decides who is getting justice. <laughs> this is for real. Oh, yeah. Blizzard has more justice than Pharaoh right now. So they are not. Look out if you try to cheat. Yeah, they're not joking around with this account banning. Um, it's pretty amazing. And I'm really glad that they're following it through so often with this. They are keeping their game as pristine as they can and definitely discouraging any cheaters from doing this. Unfortunately, yep. there's always going to be somebody who tries to cheat the system. It's always going to happen, especially on a game that has a community as large as Overwatch. There's just money on the line to be made for people who do these things. And um, unfortunately, they end up finding some support. But the best thing that can happen here is that the people who have the most control over the game have zero tolerance for this behavior and good news for us who don't cheat um they're getting what they deserve that many less cheaters in your game for you to play against so updates for season two and the competitive updates coming for the new competitive mode uh for season two are coming not next week, but the updates and some information regarding what they're going to be doing for season two is coming next week, according to Jeff Kaplan on the official forums. Yeah. So this we is just the announcement a, of the announcement, right? Yeah, yeah. This is the announcement of the announcement. They're basically saying, like, we've heard you guys asking for this for so long. Hang on. We'll be there. And it's coming next week. So hang tight, guys. This is, this is a post that was done, I believe, like two days ago, three days ago, as we're recording the show. And then Similarly, there's another one, um, somebody asking about why the replay feature isn't in yet. This is something that people ask every day. Like, this is a daily forum question. But they said that, Kaplan has said that the replay system was bumped because the people that were working on it got moved over to prioritizing the high bandwidth server technology. 
They also got bumped to work on the season two updates and the matchmaking matchmaking improvements. And third, they wanted to work on allowing players the capability of saving their highlights. So I believe that once one or two of these things kind of start rolling out and are more fine tuned, then the replay system is going to be one of the next things on their priority list. Any other comments, Andres? I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, I'm excited for it. I would really love the ability to export my highlights or save my own replays just to see them as a VOD. Uh, right now, I can do it with OBS, but it would be a lot nicer if I could have a dynamic replay where I could not only see my point of view, but I could also see the point of view or, of other people or even be able to go on third person to just be able to yeah. analyze your games a little better. That would be like so valuable for learning to me um but it'll come it'll come baby steps um i'm looking forward yeah. to it in a game where positioning is nigh impossible to ignore like positioning is so important in overwatch it's really valuable to have a replay feature where you can observe yourself in a third person format and figure out where your positioning is going wrong because even the pro players want to know their positioning they're watching vods of their previous pro matches and stuff all the time mm-hmm so even, um, the uh, last thing that we have... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, I was watching a lot of videos of um, VOD analysis. Um, this is starting to happen a little more where people will just take VODs from pros or tournaments and they will just uh, input their analysis. And what I've noticed mm -hmm. is that a lot of the analysis is really good, but because they rely on the caster's POV, sometimes the casters will miss like a very important... like movement from a player or a very important pick from a player and um the person who's analyzing the vod basically is left with his imagination to try to deduce what happened right like the the, the camera will be facing like the, a bastion or like the mccree in the back and then the mercy and the lucio get picked like in the wall behind the over and you're like, you're just left to the assumption like, well, I guess he did this and he got those two something picks. Happened. Yeah, yeah, I think sure. that McCree did something and they died. So, well, <laughs> great. Um, the beauties of live production, folks. Yeah, but it would it surely help if you can get like a live replay where you could swap points of views and then be like, oh, what did that McCree do? Let's go check it out. Right, right. Yeah. So as we transition into the next point, we have two more uh, balance updates. Um, this one was a post on competitive overwatch by the official overwatch. They said that may is going to be a target of some buffs and changes that is going to hopefully flip her into the meta a little bit more. And I guess there's also a slight bug on her ice wall that they're trying to fix internally. So look for may to get some pretty significant changes coming up. And then they're also saying that Zenyatta, like we said at the top of the show is getting a really high win percentage. And they're probably going to be targeting his Discord or orb and adjusting it slightly for the game. In addition to that, Gibraltar was showing up with a 64% win rate to attackers, which is unacceptable from a game design perspective. So they've been adjusting Gibraltar almost every other week, I think, since the game has launched. Every other patch, format. Gibraltar gets something, yeah. Yeah, so they said that the, the most recent patch that hit, I believe this is last week, um, like towards the end of the week, they finally did did it. They got Gibraltar down to a 50.5 win percentage rate. So if you're on attack, you have a 0.5% edge as an attacker, which is great news because yeah, we'll, now we'll, we'll take that point way five. more. Yeah, we'll take that 0.5, but it's still pretty even. So Gibraltar feels a lot better since they did some adjustments there, and I'm really happy about it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Have you noticed any changes since this? I, I know that I played Gibraltar the other day, and I was like, man, this is this is a lot easier to defend than it felt before. Yeah, it's not like overwhelming me easier, but um, some of the changes do help out a lot, especially, yeah, especially like the, the toning down in time. Like you don't have to hold them up for that much longer. Yeah, um, that has been really helpful. I feel like an eternity, and like you're freaking three hundred in uh, against the Persians. <laughs> you yeah, know? You're like, oh my gosh, we're holding them for so long, and I just feel like we keep dying. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it used to be so snowball snowballing from one point to the other, where one team could just like rush one checkpoint to the next very easily. Um, yep. It's a little easier now. Right. All right, let's um, talk about the biggest news thing before we finish off this section about the summer games. Andres, why don't you kick us off in the discussion here real quick? We'll, sure. we'll cover this for five minutes. Let's start a little bit. By the way, you're clicking and popping a little bit, just so you know. 
me turn down the game. There we go. All right. Okay. Summer games. So to be completely honest, um, I, when they first got announced and I first like saw like the theme of it and stuff, I was not particularly thrilled. I was like, hmm, okay, sports in Overwatch. It's kind of interesting for a you know futuristic shooter. Um, but then after I saw some of the skins and kind of like some of the vibe, especially once like Lucio Ball was introduced and stuff, I was kind of like, I don't know, I kind of got to gotta merge into it. And once I saw some of the skins in gameplay, they actually looked pretty cool. To be honest, some of them actually look really, really awesome. Like I would take him over some of the legendary skins that some of them have. Um, so it kind of grew on me. And then by the end, I was really just enjoying the whole event. It actually got me to buy some loot boxes, which is something that I haven't done before since that game came out. Um, but I don't know, since these are kind of like limited edition and somewhere down the line, it, they might be a little rare or kind of like exclusive. Um, I figured, yeah, I might as well get some of them. How about you? Have you got any of the skins? Yeah, I use some of our uh, little bit of savings uh, moving to Japan on it and <laughs> no regrets. I have both of the skins for Zarya. And I got lucky and got the British Tracer Runner skin, which I was really excited about. Nice. So I they got were... some pretty good ones. I don't know of anything else that I got that was really significant that I wanted. You know what I mean? Um, besides, like, the bicycle kick uh, highlight for Lucio. Uh -huh. I was like, yes! I have a frog doing a bicycle kick. That's so <laughs> dope. I, uh, I really wanted three things. I wanted the McCree riding a horse player icon. With the red cape kind of flag <laughs> behind him, of course. I really wanted um, the Genji uh, epic skin, like the white with red. It's oh, kind of like Nihon. Nihon. yeah, it's got like yeah. the Japan flag on him. Yep. Uh, and yep. I really want uh, the American McCree. Um, <laughs> I, got I got two the of Australian those. Australian Outback of McCree. Oh, nice. That was cool too. I got the Genji skin, and I got. Um, the the icon, but I still don't have American McCree, so I still got a couple of days. Yeah, I didn't get it either. Yeah, the the promotion ends on August twenty second, so we still have a good ten days to work on it. Um, not always lost. Pretty close to prestiging too, so I'm gonna see if I can push yeah, the prestige. Yeah, that's the key, dude. Through those first ten levels. If you're close to prestige, that's the best. I was super close to prestiging too, so I just like power through, and I just prestige. So I got my next twenty loot boxes are gonna be super easy. Jeez. Yeah, we'll have to do that. <laughs> I, I want to see people try and show. Yeah, I want to see people try to time their prestiges with like upcoming events. It's like, oh man, summer <laughs> is coming. I better yeah, get to prestige fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a minute for uh, thanking our patrons over at patreoncom Uh Thanks, special thanks towards Brian K yet again for giving Andres that microphone. That was a huge investment, and I know a big sacrifice on your end to help the show that you really like. Really appreciate your help and your support. You the man, man. So better. You are a key instrument. And as well as the key instruments on Patreon, we have Eric S. and Blackbird for being our scientist level support. Every show, we want to make sure we thank you because you guys are awesome in supporting us at the highest level. We also want to thank and welcome onto the team our new patrons and lab scientist folk, Ken M., Weston H., Dev P., Tysic C., I hope I pronounced that right, uh, and Kurt L. Thank you guys for all your support, and we're glad to have you on board. And uh, let's jump into our main topic of the week, attack and defense mentality. Let's do it. All right, folks. Attack and defense mentality. This is going to be a little guide for you to tell yourself um, what you should be doing when you're in attack and when you're in defense. And these, these also apply um, to King of the Hill maps, um, except that in King of the Hill the dynamic is a little different and how you should be sw swapping between these two mentalities. Um, but basically, we just want to give you a quick little rundown of what you should be doing when you're in this position. So let's start with attack. When you're in attack, you are in a very interesting position. Uh, one, you are usually at the advantage when you're first starting at any point. You are usually at the advantage. Your point is, or your respawn point is usually a little closer 
than the defender's um, respawn point is. That from like the get-go should tell you something. Basically, each kill that you get is slightly more valuable than any death in your group. Because of this, when you're when you're in the attack, um, you want to have a very aggressive mentality where you want to be putting up constant pressure because if you're putting constant pressure and both of you are technically um, killing each other at the same rate, your team will have the advantage eventually time-wise just because every death that they have, let's say we just went mathematically perfect and every time you kill somebody you would get killed too and same with your teammates so a one for one every time your team will eventually have more people to come back to the point faster than the enemy team I mean that's pretty self-explanatory I feel so that's why you wanna have this like fast aggressive constant pressure mentality when you're in the attack not only also, that I feel like on Hybrid maps, Andres, if you don't mind me jumping in here. Uh, I feel like on hybrid maps, especially that first capture point, this is even more important. I'm thinking like Hollywood. I'm thinking of like double capture assault maps, like the ones where you can do stuff crazy like on Hanamura. You can do it on Anubis. Like If you guys can play really aggressive on those maps, you can get very high risk, high reward. Yeah. So... When you're attacking, you kind of want to have that mentality, high risk, high reward almost, because if you're able to take down, especially their key players, and that's my second point, looking to take out their key players, you'll have a greater advantage than the defensive team. Like, the defensive team doesn't gain as much value from killing you, especially if they're killing you close to the respawn point, like at the choke point or something, like you'll be back mm -hmm. almost right away. Well, if they get killed at the choke point, they have to run back for a very long time and you have a, a window of opportunity. So that's the second thing you should be looking for. What are their key players and who should be taking out first? Usually th these key players are people like Senyata, uh, Mercy, Lucio is a good example, um, Bastion, Symmetra. Symmetra is a very good example. Basically the cornerstone of their defense, the people that will give sustain to your team and the people who are holding uh, the biggest roadblocks. For example, a Bastion or a Torbjorn, where um, you cannot fight freely because of the overwhelming pressure that these heroes can put on the battlefield. Um, this should be your priority picks. You should be moving your team around and asking your flankers, asking um, your main damage dealers to be focusing on these guys first. Because if you're able to get a pick on any of these guys, the defensive team will be extremely crippled. For example, if the enemy team picks uh, a Bastion, usually they will revolve their strategy around the Bastion and they will take a Reinhardt, a Mercy, that are all there to kind of like protect this guy and make him like really, really powerful. But once this guy is gone, um, then the defense basically falls apart. There's no cornerstone to it and your team can put up a lot of pressure. The next thing and I want to... Prioritizing um, after the cornerstone, Andres, is even equally as important because then when the cornerstone finishes, then the defense has to result to a funnel approach or like zone control of a specific avenue or choke. So then you can say, okay, who's the most valuable person in this choke? Like Junkrat, for example, is really good at zone control. There's other p people like Symmetra is really good at zone control. So if you can remove the zone control then you have actually opened up an entire zone that you can attack the point or attack the payload with right you're right the the prioritizing doesn't stop once you get that first skill right like once you get that first skill right. you gotta keep going down like the ladder of priority of like who who is next in this um who is the biggest threat next um usually tanks tend to be at the bottom of the list just because it takes so long to kill a tank, especially if they have the support of the DPS and their healer in the back, right? Like, it'll just take too long and you run the risk of any of you dying in, in between that time. Plus, not only that, but loading your enemy's ultimates to the max. Um, yeah. The next thing I want to say is, for the attack, hesitation is your worst enemy. Hopefully... 
somebody in your team is suggesting what to do or um, you're playing with a group and you have a shot caller that is like the guy that is in charge of um, calling what you're gonna do and hopefully he is good and he's paying attention to the game and what the enemy team is doing um, it's a very stressful task and it's a task that requires your team to have trust and confidence in the, in the person who's making these calls because once the call has been made you should follow through no matter what there's nothing worse when you're attacking than doubt in your team if the call gets made yeah. and two people run for it but then the other three stay behind because they they didn't believe the call was right your attack falls together at that point unless the enemy team makes a terrible mistake um, those two people that rush ahead will probably get killed and then the three people that got left behind are not gonna have enough power to pull through and then now you have to wait for the other two people to uh, come back and then you have like one person that was struggling somewhere else that you never knew where he was because he wasn't even <laughs> paying attention to the call um, mm -hmm. so basically if somebody says alright guys in the beginning we're gonna go through the left room up top and we're gonna shoot them from uh, from above them that's what you wanna do even if you think the call is not good and you might fail if that is what your team has decided to do go with it because your team will be a lot stronger if you make a wrong decision altogether than altogether. yeah than if you make the right decision by yourself if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, because the right decision by yourself isn't always the right answer. The right decision is what your team decides together. That's the right decision. Right. A united team is a lot stronger than, you know, everyone just doing their thing by their own. Um, talking about that, too, don't play into your enemy's defense. When you're making these calls, you really have to keep in mind um, why you're making these calls, right? Don't just be like, mm -hmm. let's go to the right room. And know that knowing that there's like a Symmetra and that Symmetra has like 18 turrets in that room, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like use your common Welcome sense. Welcome to the jungle, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Dissect your enemy's defense and uh, make sure that you are going routes or you're leading your team ways where your the enemy team's defense cannot capitalize on it, right? Like pick, uh, position yourself yourself favorably. An example of this is if you have a bastion covering the choke point. You don't want to be fighting at the choke point for a prolonged period of time. You have everything to lose at that point because the bastion can just point blank, shoot at you all day, yeah. load up his ult to get a few kills. You probably won't be able to pick him up from that far because he has a Reinhardt shield in front of him. So instead of that, just be like, okay, Reinhardt, we need to get past this. Get your ass up there. Put your giant square, lightning square in front of us, and we're just gonna go. One there. job. <laughs> yeah, just hold it there. I know Bastion is gonna break it in like five seconds, so that's his, that is why we need you, Lucio, to boost us right as we go through there, and our Reinhardt is covering us. And as soon as we go into the room, Reinhardt, you can follow us while still facing towards the Bastion, so we don't get shot at. And now we can all go upstairs and around it, and the Bastion cannot shoot at us uh, while we go over here. Like, that's an example of avoiding the defense. diva, and you can just, like, hmm, I'm going to eliminate all of these shots. Everybody, please, dozo to the left. Yeah. <laughs> Enter the room. Perfect. You can also take a May. You, you can take a May and make oh, her yeah, put the, the wall in front of it and be like, all right, boys, let's go. We got cover. Um, yep. That sort of thing. Also, if you see that your enemy has a teleporter, for example, wiping your enemy mm -hmm. team at that point will probably not result in what you're expecting because they can get back really fast. So you can do two things. Preemptively send your Genji or your flanker or whoever has um, a good sense of like your flanking to go get it before you do your full push. Or alternatively, as soon as you do the push, everyone needs to like full speed take down that teleporter fast yeah yeah um same again agree more don't play into your enemy's defenses realize what their cornerstones of defense are and take care of that first and do it in a way that you don't play into it right 
Don't run into the room where the Junkrat is spamming, like you will probably get killed immediately in a sea of grenades as you just rush into it, you know what I mean? And be willing to know if you belong on the back line or in the front line. Like, if you're playing Zenyatta, you shouldn't be pushing the team forward. You should be hanging in the back of the team, helping the team maintain their push. Unless you have your transcendence in which you say, we're going, here we go. <laughs> that kind of a thing. Right, I cannot stress this enough. I have seen so many Zenyattas that just rush in head first. Well, they have a Reinhardt like two feet right behind them. We're not a Genji. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You like can't just do that. just hold it back a little bit and wait for the right formation, right? Let your tanks go in first, then let your um, DPS or whatever it is next, and then you can come in as support uh, behind them. And do this every time, right? Like be aware of your positioning and how you're approaching rooms. Um, also, very importantly, when the battle is lost, like no one is lost. If you if you're uh, if the enemy team got three picks on you and it's a six versus three, it's lost. Like you're you're probably not gonna get that. Like sure, sometimes you can have that moment of brilliance with Kenji and go full seagull on the enemy team and just do like a one v six and your name will go down. Like yeah, your name will go down in history. And you will be forever remembered because of that day. But the chances of that happening are very, very low. So as soon as you see three of your teammates die, get the hell out of there. You have no business being at the point anymore. It, it will be better for your team if you retreat as a group, whoever is still alive. Maybe you can get a lucky pick because the enemy team gets really greedy. And as soon as they see three of you die... They're going to come chase you. Um, and maybe you can get a, a lucky pick while they're chasing you down. But you're going back to safety as your group rejoins you. And that will cut down on downtime time for your team very, very much. You're racing against the clock. And every second that your team wastes, just kind of like hanging around and waiting for everyone. Or your team just streaming deaths where you waste a whole minute because everyone's just going in one by one and dying by themselves. Is the worst thing you can do. You will run the clock down really, really fast if you don't learn how to uh, how to lose fights, basically. Yeah, that's what defense wants you to do. They want you to waste the clock. They want to get a couple picks. They want you always to be one or two men down so you can't fight against their six. That's the ideal defense. The last thing I want to say about attack, and this is more of a of an approach that I think uh, it has worked for me a lot, and I have won a lot more with teams that are really good at doing this. And this also comes with the quality of the players. Like players who um, get a little better and who really know what they're doing tend to do this a lot more just naturally. And is um, the high mobility and multiple angles of attack and uh, knowing how to take your enemy by surprise, not being predictable. Um, really, really strong attacking teams. When they do the attack, one, they're really fast at it. They come in guns blazing. Like they're not doubting what they're doing. They come in, usually Lucio speed boosted. Everybody knows who their target is going to be, and they're not usually coming in all from the same side. Like they have their Genji flanking from one side. Maybe they have like their Reinhardt soldier up above. Yeah, their Reinhardt with uh, soldier or McCree and the Senyata from one side, and then they have maybe another DPS or like their their Saria coming in from like a different angle, which has view on all their teammates. Sometimes they might even have a Winston that kind of like hangs around on the angle and just waits for the right call, and then he makes the jump. And um, mm -hmm. this, one one of the things that it does, it, it adds a lot of confusion for the defending team. If they turn their eyes to they that... Their target. Yeah, when they turn their eyes to that Reinhardt and McCree that is shooting at them, they're like, oh, they spot them, they start shooting at them, From next thing they know, they have Genji in their back. And then next thing they know, they have a monkey falling right next to their mercy. Sitting on them. And then suddenly they have three calls in their comms. They're like, oh, Genji behind. Oh, Winston and Diva. Or, or I mean, Mercy. Yep. And then they're like, oh, but M McCree, dead eye, top. You know what I mean? And then yeah. they have to deal with three things at the same time. That is very confusing and very nerve-wracking. And most of the time... As a human being, you just can't. You just can't like analyze a situation that complex. You can only deal with a couple of things at a time. 
Um, so being able to do this effectively as the attacking team can give you a great advantage, right? All attacking at the same time, all like rushing and fast, um, like a coordinated attack. Just go for it. Yep. All right, let's talk defense. I don't want to add too much to this show as it is like getting a little long, and I want to make sure that we can address Ryan's email today. So defense mentality. Right, let's Anything go through here? defense uh, a little fast since we already talked a lot about attack. Defense is basically yeah. almost the opposite mentality that you want to have on attack. On defense, you want to play super, super conservatively. Your life is super precious on defense because of the reasons we already talked on defense. You are at a disadvantage, especially depending on where your spawn point is, most of the time on, on, on defense, unless you're like right at the end of the line you're about to lose the game and the payload is like right there on your spawn but most of the time you're at a disadvantage so you have to be very conservative you cannot be risking your life you cannot be foolish with your things um, on defense is a time to stick to your allies look for their protection let them protect you and definitely protect them you have to be looking out, out after each other a lot on defense and you have to pick your battles because if you lose a battle that is more than likely a lost checkpoint or a lost game whether on attack if you lose a battle is just well let's try it again um, yeah because of the reason you want to be like super concerned with that one of the things you can do to that and we've talked about it in the show before is covering all of your access routes but then I want to go a little deeper on this. Um, sometimes people think covering their access routes is you will not leave this place until you die. And that is not the mentality yeah. you want to have. When you're holding an access route is you're watching out for anybody to come in there. And if, it's get, if it gets breached by like one or two heroes, especially if it's a fight that you're good at, like if you're a soldier and a junk rat comes in walking, like, okay, you might be able to take on that fight, like shoot at them. Um, if things start getting a little hairy and the junk rat starts getting a lot of leeway on you, get out of there, run out of there, go meet the rest of your team, say it and comes that the junk rat has just breached and come back with your Zenyatta or your McCree and a couple other people, kill that junk rat and make yeah. sure everything is okay. Or likewise, especially if, on payload. Yeah, especially on payload. Especially if like the enemy team all rushes into the room you're covering, like you're not winning that fight. You know what I mean? At that point, the best thing you can do is just let the whole team know that the enemy team is there, and run for cover, run for a better situation for you when you, you can actually shoot him without dying immediately. Um, so is you definitely want this defense is more of a ebb and flow instead of a hold the line like you, you want to be able to give and take as you can but you don't want to give too much ground and you also don't want to take too much ground in order for the risk of you or other teammates dying exposed like you don't have to go in with the whole team to attack like this is a defensive maneuver, not a full on aggressive like attack them off the payload because they're just going to come right back. Yep. Also, situational awareness is very important on defense. You need to have a relative knowledge of where your team is going to be. And being disorganized on defense can be very detrimental. Like if you don't know that your Reinhardt is going to be there in the street, if you don't know that your Mercy is going to be behind, if you're covering your access route and we need to back down to find your mercy, she's nowhere to be found, um, you're going to have a really bad time. On that attack, sometimes it's a little more forgiving just because being all over the place and kind of distracting the, the defense team can be very good for you. On defense, being all scattered and all over the map where you cannot find your allies makes you very, very uh, weak and vulnerable. You want to be maybe a little spread out, but in a way that if you need to group up back together, you can do it easily. That's why um, you want to pick certain choke points or certain positions where you can cover all the access routes, but as well regroup um, back when needed without having to you know, go through the whole enemy team to get back to your team. Um, sure. Also, 
make sure you pick your battles. Contest the objective when it's appropriate. You don't have to be contesting the objective at all times. Like it's okay if they get a little bit of a uh, little wide loading bar around it. Um, it's okay if they get half of the objective and then you come and you wipe them. Um, as long as you're not putting yourself at a disadvantageous position just to prevent them from touching the payload, especially if the payload is not close to like getting to the point or they're not close to capping the capture point, um, you don't need to be on top of the payload, especially if they're just gonna kill you, right? If your whole team is not there to back you up. And revolve around the point. Position yourself around the point. You don't have to be fighting too far ahead. You don't have to be fighting too far behind. You want to revolve around where the point is. You don't have to be standing right on it if that's gonna make you very vulnerable to other shots like a sitting duck. But you do want to have a good visual of it just so when the enemy team comes, you can um, know where to move. Yeah, that. On, on that point, Andres, right before we go into our last point, the revolving around the point is one of the main key functions that you're going to want to keep in mind when you're going on a control map, especially. Once you've flipped the control point and it's yours, you don't have to sit on it. it especially, you should try not to because then you want to basically open up the area where people are accessing the point to try to capture it and shooting them when they get on it. That's that's kind of like a built-in funnel. Like everybody's trying to get that one objective. So you know where they're going to go. The last thing I want to do, or the last thing I want to say about defense, I mean, this is the only thing that you get from this show tonight. I <laughs> will be happy. But please, for the love of God and everything that is holy, Use your ultimates reactively when you're in defense. You don't need to get a team kill um, in the middle of the street. While they all have their ultimates up, you know what I mean? It's okay. As a defending team, you don't need to blow three ultimates to kill two heroes that were not doing much at the time. Your ultimates are very precious. And... When shit hits the fan, for lack of a better word, you're gonna want those very, very much. What I'm talking about is when that fully charged Zarya comes out rushing through that door and she throws your graviton at you, you wanna have that Lucio or that Senyana ult to pad the beating that your team is about to take. <laughs> when everybody oh comes gosh, out rushing, imagine. when everybody comes out rushing into the point with Lucio's speed boost, and you cannot target anyone because they're moving so fast, that is like watching a Dragon Ball Z fight. You're gonna want that <laughs> dead eye standing on the corner behind your Reinhardt, so that they all have to scatter like flies, or they're gonna get destroyed. So the, Andres, the, you sound like you're speaking from experience here. <laughs> <laughs> Is this like a PTSD for you? <laughs> Listen, I told you that I've been playing a lot of competitive this week, and there is nothing more aggravating than watching your Saria just blow her graviton like way out in the distance, and then what are you doing? and then immediately lose the point because you couldn't defend it. Yeah. I mean, it's like, but we just had a graviton and like a diva ult. Like we could have blown their entire team up apart. But instead Diva decided to throw her mech all you the way to, to be spawn. A hero. <laughs> yeah. And sorry, I don't know why she's doing with her gravity. <laughs> so yes, please. Your your ultimates are very, very valuable when you're in defense. So use them wisely and use them to counter the ultimates that your the enemy team is using. Um, you can't predict when they're gonna use them, but if you have them then you'll have the alternative to you know, probably live. Yeah, Zombieland rule number 17, don't be a hero. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, especially <laughs> on defense. No, just stick with your team and kill them as a team, you know what I mean? There's no room for Rambos when you're on defense. <laughs> especially if you're a tank. <laughs> especially if you're a tank, right. yes. Let's, uh, let's get to our emails. So I'll read the email. We have from Mr. One and Only Ryan Rays. Um, he is going to say that uh, he wants to have an additional note or a, like a prerequisite for the email saying he's on PlayStation 4, so the meta 
before his question could be a different answer from console to PC and just wants to know what our thoughts are on the overarching email, um, if we can split our opinions between console and PC. Obviously, PC is more of our wheelhouse, but here we go. Greetings and salutations and any other colloquial hellos to the Omnic Labs. Ryan Ray's here thanking you for answering all my other previous emails and finding myself in deep thoughts about Team Comp and wanting some expertise. So I found a pseudo group to play with and we went on a tear until hitting a skill cap and feeling the wrath of better teams. Our primary uh, team comp was a Diva Reaper, 76 Lucio, Zenyatta, and then a flex position that plays Genji Tracer or Junkrat. So it sounds like a flex, a uh, defense, or flanker. As we developed into... Uh, as, as stated, we were on a tear until we went to the better players. This was uh, after an hour, and things quickly devolved into class switching and miscommunications. You know how that goes. So in talking to my teammates, we began to determine the need for a different makeup of the team comp. We saw the things you'll primarily see. Zen Lucio, Zari McCree, Reinhardt Reaper, and Genji. In our group, no one plays Reinhardt. None of us are good with him, and for the most part, we find him pretty boring. I'm afraid this is going to fall on me since I've made D.Va and Zarya, but I feel like tanking should fall on the person who tanks. This is going somewhere, I promise. <laughs> However, I'm left in the question, do we need a Reinhardt? Does Reinhardt, is Reinhardt a must-have for all game types uh, or even just specific ones? And then lastly, what kind of tips do you give as an aspiring Reinhardt is already a negative about having to use him? <laughs> and as a D.Va player, does the transition feel... Uh, let's see, as a D.Va player, he says the transition feels like a night and day. Thanks, and looking forward to your response. All right. Thanks for the email, Ryan. Really appreciate it. I think this is a very valid point. Um, like you said, maybe the meta on the PS4 is slightly different, although I think that Reinhardt is equally useful on the PC, and he still gets a ton of play on the competitive scene. He's still one of the main tanks for whatever thing you, you want to do. And there's a couple of simple reasons for it, I think. <clears throat> One, there is no better hero at contesting a spades than Reinhardt. Like, just by itself, a single kit. Like, you could argue, like, Roadhog with his ult can just take anyone out of there, or the monkey with his ultimate can also, like, zone everyone away. And true. But Reinhardt, just with his basic abilities, he's like a giant pile of muscle that can block all bullets that are coming not only at him, but at anyone behind him in like a pretty big area, like his rectangle is really, really big. And not only that, like try standing right next to a Reinhardt is the most painful thing in the entire world. You're getting bashed by a hammer with rockets. <laughs> that thing hurts like crazy. Most most heroes in Especially when they get an Ana boosted. Oh That's my scary. god, oh my god. Don't even let's not even get started with Nano boost at Reinhardt. <laughs> Let's just go with regular Reinhardt first. Um, most heroes die with like two, maybe three hits from Reinhardt's hammer. And it doesn't require much aiming, and the range from the hammer is huge. So you cannot be standing near Reinhardt very easily. Um, so just from that viewpoint, he's the best hero to just stand in a place and hold it by himself, and especially if he has people behind him healing him and shooting at the people who are trying to take the space, um, it's just really, really strong. There's other heroes that can do similar things. Um, Diva, for example, can now do something similar to Reinhardt, but only for a little bit, and um, with the Matrix, just for that. Yeah. And the difference between Diva is that if you actually put a Diva right next to a Reinhardt, Reinhardt to me, it's a natural counter to D.Va. He just manhandles that little robot. Like, that mech has no business. He doesn't deal damage damage to Reinhardt. One, because he, he has a ton of armor, has health. And two, he has a ton of health. And when you start hammering at a D.Va, you can just hear that mech just falling apart, man. And you only need to hit it, like, three or four times. And as soon as Diva is out, you just need to like swing it one more time, and Diva is done. I'm sure that anyone who has played Diva and has tried firing at a Reinhardt at like point blank has regretted it deeply, unless they have like their whole team backing them up together. 
So just from that standpoint, Diva doesn't have the zoning power around her that Reinhardt has. If she was uh, being the front line of the team and your enemy team has a Reinhardt, that Reinhardt is going to have the upper hand in like taking out Diva from the front line. Same with Roadhog. Yeah. Roadhog doesn't have a Diva shield. And, Diva and Winston are kind of like the ones that you want to go into the back lines and then come out. Like, they kind of did are more of a disruption tank. I know we've had, probably talked about that way earlier, um, even before Diva was changed. But Diva's kind of like a hybrid between the disruption and the Reinhardt now that the uh, Matrix is kind of adjusted. Yeah. But you have to realize that every hero you play, it doesn't matter what tank you're going to play, whether you main Reinhardt, or I'm sorry, whether you main Roadhog or Diva or Zarya or Winston, when you switch to Reinhardt, it's going to feel different. Like he does a completely different function than most of the other tanks. So learning how to play Reinhardt would be one of your best things. I know that there's a few guys in our Discord. You can go hang out with them and talk with them. I know that Rice Krispie plays a lot of Reinhardt, and I was playing him with, with Anna and... Reinhardt just gives you a different function. It looks like your team comp can really benefit from one because you can have a 76 parked right next to him with a Lucio and really just push through or a Zenyatta. And then you can let your Tracer or Genji just go a wall and do whatever they want, you know, as a flanker. That's the other thing that I was about to say. Um, really good point there. By the composition you wrote us here in the email, you say you're playing Diva, Reaper, 76, Lucio, Zen, and then somebody switches between Genji, Tracer, and Junkrat. Right there, like, that comp could benefit so comp. so much from a Reinhardt. Um, not to say that D.Va wouldn't work. Honestly, a Reinhardt and a D.Va might actually work really, really well there. Um, you don't have yeah, to run three DPSs. Reaper? Um, Reaper, I mean, you, you can decide, but honestly, this would be fine if you change the D.Va to a Reinhardt, which you have already noticed. Um, just because... Yeah. Think about your 76, your Zen, and your Lucio. Most of them are have to be kind of out there, a little vulnerable, especially Zen. He doesn't have a lot of ways to avoid damage. And he if he has to be out in the open, um, a really good McCree or a really good um, Soldier 76, any Widowmaker can have a, a really good shot on him and can take him out really easily for your team, which might be what is happening. While a Reinhardt can provide a lot of cover, allowing Zen to or Soldier 76 to keep shooting and putting up a lot of their pressure without being so vulnerable. Um, mm. It also allows you to contest a little better. It seems like with this team, you might have a little trouble contesting just because a lot of you are squishy. And as soon as D.Va loses the mech, um, she cannot really fight on the point, right? She has to get out of there. Well, if Reinhardt loses the shield, he's still, you know, a giant dude that is swinging his hammer right next to the point. Hope we answered your question. I know that uh, one other point for the difference between PlayStation and PC is that you're going to have a lot more precision when you're playing D.Va with that matrix. You're going to, because it's so small, you actually have a pretty good idea of where you can position it with the mouse as opposed to your joystick. And I feel like your learning curve for playing Reinhardt is a little bit uh, easier to master as opposed to mastering your D.Va. So even though you are switching, I feel like you're going to have an easier time switching than if it was the other way around, like if you're trying to learn D.Va. Yep. The last thing I want to say is I don't want to say that Reinhardt is absolutely necessary in this meta game. Um, That's a good thing. Right now, the, the meta is favoring teams that can really use on Reinhardt. Like, especially like the Sen Lucio combo loves Reinhardt in their team. Um, especially with a McCree behind. A lot of people love Lu running McCree, Sen, and Lucio. And those three just freaking love being behind the uh, Reinhardt shield. It's like the perfect synergy right there. But yeah. there's a lot of other compositions that actually Reinhardt is kind of sucky on them. Um, before this meta started to develop, there was a lot of fair play, and fair is still viable. Um, you just kind of like have to work around it, and you have to know how to dodge that um, Discord plus McCree's all over the place. But for example, those company, those compositions that would rely a lot on the uh, Mercy with Farah, sometimes they didn't have as much use for Reinhardt because they usually would run like a Genji as well that would go into the back 
So at that point, a diva with Saria or something, even like a Roadhog, um, would be a lot more useful because they're heroes that can actually um, follow up with Farah, for example. Diva can fly up to her if she needs help. Uh, well, Reinhardt, who, who is he going to be covering if everyone's just flying and flanking? You know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely know what you mean. Well, guys, that was the show. Uh, it was great, and we want to take a quick minute to... Wow, we, we don't have much time. So I'm just going to read off those who gave us uh, five-star reviews this week. We have special thanks to those on iTunes doing this. Uh, the Brometheus, but not the freak, Deuterman reviewer, and HP Seton. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show um, in the best way that you can without spending any money. And we really appreciate it, even if you're not a patron. Uh, if you guys can give us a quick iTunes review, it does help the show get seen. It helps us continue to... Let us know what we need to improve on, even if it's not a five-star review or it's four or one or two. We've gotten all kinds of reviews in the last couple weeks, even with the absence. Um, we really appreciate the feedback. Keep, keep it coming. If you want it to be negative, that's fine. Well, we'll, we'll still take it. We, we love feedback. Like We want to make the show better. So if you find it boring, please be specific why you find it boring because some of the reviews right now, even if they're negative, are not helpful negative ones. Like, we want the constructive feedback. Yeah, so if you're going to be negative, tell us why. Because <laughs> we want to make it better for you. If, you. if you don't like the show, great. That's fine. It may be not for you. But we don't try to be uh, the same show for everybody. Um, we want to make it to our niche. And we also don't want to make it boring for you. So let us know. Um, even if you already let your iTunes review and we missed it and it is like that, just shoot us an email um, over at omniclabpodcast.gmail.com or join us on discord.me slash omniclab if you guys want to tell us what you think and want to hang out and find some more folks to go play. I know um, there are players that are playing on multiple platforms as well as only console in our Discord just trying to find people to play with that are good. So go hang out there. We'll maybe put you in contact there. You can always find us on Twitter and Facebook at Omnic Lab. You can check out our Patreon. And if you are interested in some of the perks, we're going to roll out a few of those shortly. It'll probably be on a different timetable than what you're used to because I'm the one that does it. And I'm on a 13-hour time change ahead of you in Japan if you're on East Coast and 16 if you're on West Coast. So just be patient with us. We're get, we'll get to your rewards. If you want to find the full show notes, uh, you can go to our website over at OmniClab.com and you can click the link to our Google Doc if you want to see the full show notes. Andres, where can people find you? Personally, if you want to find me, follow me on Twitter at iPlayGames. You spell that I-P-L-A-I Games. I've also been streaming a ton on the Omnic Lab um, Twitch channel. Um, I'm, I've been kind of making that my hub because I, I find no use in like having two different Twitch yeah. channels just for like basically doing the same thing. Ma mainly streaming Overwatch. I've been streaming a lot of comp. Um, I also got No Man's Sky, so I've been streaming my journey through the universe on that game. It's quite Ooh. fun, actually. Uh, I just started on my first planet. Um, it's a little cold, nice. it's a little cold planet, but um, there's a lot of fauna and flora to explore. A little desolate uh, in some parts, but kind of cool. So if you want to check me out, uh, exploring the universe, uh, make sure you stay tuned to our uh, Twitch channel. I'm working on that, and also catch me on my Hearthstone podcast. Coin Concede. If you guys are interested in Hearthstone, the new expansion just came out, so there's a lot to talk about. I've been experimenting with a little beast druid of my own. Still waiting for yeah, that me uh, Menagerie <laughs> Warden to come out, but it's looking good. Uh, yeah, dude. You guys can uh, also find me over at twitter.com slash notrob, uh, posting on different time zones. <laughs> and you can also find my Hearthstone podcast over at valencechosen.com. We just recorded at 2 a.m. my time last night. It was a great show. Finally able to get back. I'm not able to do much of the editing anymore, which is kind of sad. But, um, yeah, we're working on it. And hang tight with us. Uh, I'm really enjoying playing Hearthstone. It's really hard actually trying to pick times to play Overwatch over Hearthstone because I'm enjoying both of them just equally right now. So, uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying uh, all, the, all the cards, all the people, all the communities. Really enjoy it. And guys, we thank you so much for listening to episode number 18. Thanks for being patient with us in our transition and also in adjusting like these time schedules. And I know the time changes aren't going to always be like this. Andres is trying to work his schedule around, but we really appreciate the support from patrons and from listeners alike. We'll see you guys next week. And remember, don't be a lab rat. Be a scientist. We'll see you guys next week.
and not to teach. 